Hello, friends. My name is Gabriel. Welcome to Exploring the Quran and the Bible. Most of the episodes we do here are about the Quran, but here is an episode about the Bible. In this episode, I speak with an exceptional scholar of American religious history, Mark Knoll, and we speak about his recent book on the Bible in America. Did you know that the Bible was not always sort of an area of agreement that it should be at the center of American life? From the very beginnings of the American project, there was a diversity of voices on the Bible. There were polemics around the Bible. Uh, the Bible was enormously important to how uh, early Americans saw the American project and how they carried out their lives, to their devotions and spirituality. But there were also great debates and polemics surrounding the Bible. Get the full story by watching this episode. Thank you so much for being here. I think you're really going to enjoy this episode. Please take a moment to like this video and to subscribe to Exploring the Quran and the Bible. Hello, Professor Mark Noel. Thank you for being with me. Well, thank you. It's an honor to be on your program. Yeah, it was, it's really exciting to uh, have a chance to speak with you. Most of the conversations on exploring the Quran and the Bible are actually exploring the Quran. <laughs> and so it's exciting to have uh, a change of pace. And so we'll be speaking about the Bible and uh, your book, especially a recent publication, America's book, The Rise and Decline of a Bible Civilization, 1794 to 1911. Uh, so this is not something I know a lot about, so I might ask some poorly informed questions, but uh, yeah, it's great, great to be here, and I look forward to speaking about uh, why the Bible is such a central part of American history. So um, yeah, if it's okay, I'll start with a brief bio, everyone, and uh, then we'll get into some questions uh, about uh, current events. The first the first question is about the current moment, so uh, in Amer recent American presidents, and then we'll go through the history. So everyone, Professor Mark Knoll is a retired historian who taught for many years at Wheaton College in Illinois, and then for 10 years at the University of Notre Dame, where we were colleagues. He has been researching the history of the Bible in America since co-editing the book in 1982 with former Notre Dame Provost Nathan Hatch, entitled the Bible in America, Essays and Cultural History. Mark's other relevant books include a study of 20th century Bible scholarship by white American evangelicals and a two volume sequence. So first, in the beginning was the word, the Bible in American public life, which covers a period between 1492 to 1787, published in 2016, and the recently published America's book, the Rise and Decline of a Bible Civilization, 1794 to 1911, uh, published just in 2022. Were they both published with the same press then? Right, they're both uh, Oxford University Press. And, and the, the uh, second book is actually co-dedicated to uh, Cynthia Reed, the longstanding uh, editor at Oxford, who did so much over a period of maybe 40 years to promote the, uh, the study of religion in America really was a, a crucial factor in making that a live field. I must add for this audience that the other co-dedicatees were the chairs of the history department during my time at uh, Notre Dame, a uh, time that I, I greatly appreciated and was glad to acknowledge with that co-dedication. Beautiful. Yes. So everyone, uh, America's book, The Rise and Decline of a Bible Civilization, 1794 to 1911, is uh, a remarkable work of primary source scholarship, which engages uh, with uh, just an incredible array of figures, uh, American figures uh, from the beginning of, uh, oh, I mean, the, sort of the beginning of federalism, the constitution, the question of our constitution, all the way up to the beginning of the 20th century. We'll speak about why the, the date range covered by the book ends in 1911. Uh, but I mean, there, there are so many insightful passages which shed light on uh, different perspectives, intense debates, polemics in American history. I mean, we'll speak about some of it, but uh, the, the archival research is extraordinary and it's also written very well. It's an enter entertaining read. So I'd encourage everyone to buy America's book, The Rise and Decline of a Bible Civilization. At the beginning of the book, um, Mark, you uh, open with some recent anecdotes of presidents and the Bible. You speak about uh, uh, a, a, a speech by George W. Bush. Uh, you mentioned the prayer breakfast, the annual prayer breakfast and the engagement with the Bible and that with Barack Obama. And then um, in a more uh, maybe sensitive uh, event, you speak about the scene of Donald Trump holding a Bible in front of St. John's Episcopal Church 
um, in the wake of, or in the midst of protests surrounding the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, so yeah, why why did you choose to start the book with these anecdotes? Well, I think the, uh, a prime goal was to have some kind of contact with readers concerning some things that might actually be in a contemporary memory. The book is pretty heavy history and, and is demanding in that it asks people to uh, rethink uh, the founding of the United States, what that founding meant, how things developed in the antebellum period, particularly, and then with uh, effects later on. And I thought by, uh, by showing that the Bible remains alive in public life in the United States, but, but in a, a very fragmentary and politically polemical way. Hmm. It was interesting after uh, Donald Trump appeared with the Bible during the, uh, the, the demonstrations for Black Lives Matter, that there was uh, a pushback. There were there were uh, people who, uh, obviously Democrats, who thought it was all a joke. But then th then there were uh, serious people like the president of the American Bible Society who said, "Well, we would rather have people read the Bible than display the Bible." And they act the American Bible Society, which, which was said, close to close to Biden's comments, I think, at the time. Yeah, I, he he was, like right. That. Well, we, we, yeah, yes, he was he was quoted. But the the, the, the point really was that uh, the Bible throughout American history has been a public book. And th this was an illustration of current leaders appealing to the Bible. Uh, part of the, the book explains about how presidents, Abraham Lincoln, for example, very adept at quoting the Bible, though never a conventional Christian, um, uh, uh, presidents like uh, William McKinley, uh, 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 Benjamin Harrison, en enter into the book at, at different points. So, so it was a way of trying to get get to the uh, to the thesis what that the Bible has been important in American public life, not nearly to the degree in the recent past as earlier, but still with a lingering effect. Right, and I think we may end up there because at the end, uh, I'd like to ask you about how you see the current moment and maybe the future of America's engagement with the Bible. But let's go back. Uh, to the early uh, the early period of the founding of the country. Um, I won't speak too much about the colonial period, which is really covered in your 2016 book, In the Beginning Was the Word. Uh, but I did want to ask you to maybe set the scene for us. Um, you know, uh, at the time, uh, at the time of the revolution, immediately following the revolution, um, uh, and I suppose it's inevitable to speak a little bit about the situation between church, state, and Bible in England, because the colonists were overwhelmingly uh, Protestants of an English background. So could you describe uh, how uh, the relationship between what's going on in England and the situation in the early United States? I think maybe two two things are most uh, pertinent from that earlier history for what came later. Uh, first was the way in which uh, Protestant attachment to the Bible was really part of Protestant attachment to the British Empire. And where that those attachments became sharply focused was during the what's Seven Years' War, the French and Indian War, 1750s, early 1760s, when the, the English-French battle was pictured in terms of liberty, Protestantism, and the Bible versus tyranny, Catholicism, and scorn of the Bible. So in colonial America, uh, Protestant attachment to the Bible is very much part of the Protestant attachment to Britain. And the Bible is used, not everywhere, but very consistently in the French and Indian War and in the American Revolution, but mostly emblematically. There's a little bit of Bible debate does scripture justify the kind of revolution that we're engaging in versus Britain? But, but mostly uh, the Bible was emblems. So um, uh, Thomas Jefferson and, and uh, Benjamin Franklin are charged by the Continental Congress to propose a seal of the United States. And what they propose is the a, a picture of the, the cloud leading Israel by, what is it, night, the day and the, the fire by night for the seal of the United States. This, yeah. this is not Bible teaching. But it's the use of Bible emblems, and, and then the, the loyalist ministers would, would point to Bible stories where the where the people revolted against the king, and, and nasty thing, things happened. Once, however, the separation of church and state takes place, then Americans are cast into a new situation. How do we put to use our religious heritage in this new 
constitutional governmental environment. And there we do see a, a big shift. And for reasons that uh, occupy the first, maybe the third of the, the, the newer book, I, I try to make the case that the Bible becomes a different kind of book in the United States of America that had been in the British colonies because people began to look, Bible believers of different sort, Bible believers of different sort began to look for the Bible's teaching as a guide for American life. Hmm. It just had, that just had not been prominent. The, the one place where it had begun to surface, but very late, much later than we can imagine that it would, by the late 1760s into the 1770s, there were actually Bible arguments being made for and against slavery. And those would, of course, become very, very important in, in the course of, of uh, antebellum history. But I try to uh, make the case, and I think it's well demonstrated in, in the uh, sources of the period, that American Protestants, which was basically the entire public space, there was a small Catholic contingent, but American Protestants began to think about biblical teaching as somehow a guide. And the crucial matter there was, as framed by many, many of the founding fathers, a republic that does away with monarchy, inherited titles, does away even with the respect given to ancient universities, Oxford and Cambridge. A republic needs some vehicle to stabilize. And in the theory, the theory of the age, a republic needs citizens of virtue, meaning yes. altruistic action for the public good. How can we avoid the anarchy that the loyalists said, well, if you have anything democratic and anything republican, you're just going to have an anarchical situation. John Wesley in England, who was not a fan at all of the American Revolution, said Republicans make the worst tyrants. In other words, they whip up public uh, enthusiasm, public uh, the demographic, the, the, they're demagogues and they, they whip up coercion. American leaders said, no, I think it's possible for the people to have at least a measure of virtue. And of course, Christian ideas of virtue were, were smuggling in. How do we do this? Well, we have to promote virtue in the public. And uh, because of uh, the activity of very energetic Methodist uh, evangelists, Baptist preachers, Congregationalists, Presbyterians, Protestants in the early United States began to look to the Bible for promoting the virtue without which republics would fail. Hmm. So we have a lot of continuity, trust in the, uh, the Protestant understanding of God's relationship to the world, use of the King James Bible, which is just, just taken for granted everywhere, but also a significant shift in expectations about how the Bible we put to use. No longer is it just a part of conventional British Protestantism, but it becomes a, a kind of self-conscious tool for doing what needs to be done to keep a republic on course. Mm, very good point. Very interesting uh, observation also in regard to virtue, the place of virtue and some I like to return to, but I want to pick up on something you mentioned a bit earlier, which I think was related to the seal and the cloud which guided the Israelites. Because, um, I mean, in the book, you speak of the metaphor of the exodus of the Israelites, or maybe the people Israel generally, as a type of um, the American people, or uh, a metaphor analogy by which America conceived of itself. Uh, is that stubborn? Is that, is that used uh, by, continue to be used by various people? Yeah, um, what is right. it meant to express? As soon as... Um... And particularly, in the, again, the French and Indian War, liberty is associated with uh, a good government, Protestantism, and the British Empire. Then, then liberty becomes a kind of uh, uh, light motif that will uh, continue in, in the discourse of Americans, and really, really right, right to the present. What is interesting about the, the uh, use of Old Testament Hebrew scripture analogies is that there is a long tradition, uh, particularly with the Puritans, but then also more broadly in uh, British Protestantism, to think of Britain as in some sense analogous to replicating the, the history of Israel. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that uh, mindset helped propel at least some of the patriots who thought, well, it, 
because we're now defending freedom, not against Catholic France, but against a tyrannical parliament. And just as a parenthesis, there were quite a few American patriots who began to call the British parliament Jesuitical, papist, because the association of tyranny and the Pope had become so strong that when parliament looks like the agent of tyranny, well, it must be in some sense. Even if it's Catholic, a Protestant Catholic. parliament, yes. But the, the so but and that that sense of some kind of special destiny under God analogous to the o Old Testament Israel does continue and, and becomes I mean in some sense it continues to, to this day. Interestingly enough, however, those who opposed the revolution, the loyalist clergy and the loyalist uh, uh, lay people, could use the same resource from the Old Testament to talk about what was happening in, in the uh, revolutionary period. So in their mind. Uh, uh, Pharaoh was not King George, but the Continental Congress. The exodus was not of the United States escaping from Britain, but the, but the exodus was, was somehow the, uh, the, the rescue of the loyalists who had remained, remained faithful to their vows to a properly constituted monarch. So the plasticity of biblical metaphors came, came into play uh, with uh, astounding force. Yes. Well, in the early period, you speak of also a, um, a, a rather enthusiastic uh, abandonment of the notion of state sponsorship of any particular denomination. Uh, I think you say with, with only a little, yeah, I have here the quotation, with only a little hesitation, the American states were also abandoning government sponsorship of religion. Again, without returning too far back into the colonial past, I mean, there was a period where certain colonies were associated with certain denominations or churches. Uh, but it seems like um, in the early post-revolutionary period, everyone agreed that this this was not a good idea. I mean, you already mentioned Methodists and Presbyterians, Congregationalists, Baptists. So was it was the idea that even within Protestantism were too diverse to advance any idea of uh, of, a, of a national church or state-sponsored church? Um, or were there uh, distinctly American ideas about uh, religion from bottom up and uh, we should do it differently? All, all of the above. <laughs> uh, the story is actually uh, more complicated than, than it, it appears in the sh short, simplistic views. We, we know about the First Amendment to the Constitution, which said that uh, the United States will not have an established church and will guarantee the free exercise of religion. And we think that that, that meant the new situation, but it's not until a, a, a full generation has passed that all of the new American states divest themselves of the uh, what John Adams from Massachusetts called, it's called the slender or the mild establishment. Massachusetts has a uh, government sponsorship of Congregational churches until 1833, mm -hmm. uh, Connecticut until 1818, New Hampshire uh, and, and uh, uh, Connecticut in, in their own way. The Church of England is established in most of the southern colonies, but it, it's it is a thin es establishment. And even though the, the the new state constitutions, I think nine, ten, or eleven of them have some kind of clause talking about uh, Protestantism or the necessity of off office holders to uh, believe in the Bible. Uh, 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 Maryland, uh, which has a Catholic origin, as a statement about not slandering uh, Christian things, but the, certainly the movement is away from trusting in, in church establishment. And in the early United States, there are there are Christian groups, particularly the Baptists and what would become known as the the Christian movement. Uh, eventually, Disciples of Christ, following Alexander Campbell, there there are. Protestants who are vigorously opposed to any hint of establishment. Any hint of establishment is just a replication of the Church of England. And we know that the Church of England and its establishment had contributed uh, manifestly to the tyranny, to, to, the, to the corruption that had uh, entered into Parliament and made England's, Britain's control of the colony so repressive. So the, the the uh, discussion of the, the prominence of the, of the idea of liberty is uh, contested in the early United States. Freedom of religion is universally agreed to. 
John mm. Adams is one of the strongest supporters of, of uh, what he calls Massachusetts slender establishment, but he doesn't want any coercion of people who don't want to be congregations. It just what does that phrase them. mean, sl slender establishment? Just sort of low-key low presence of... No, it meant tax, tax, uh, uh, taxes were authorized by the Massachusetts legislature to be gathered, to be at, at the local level, to be used for congregational churches. Okay, but, okay. But dissenters were allowed to opt out. So if you were a Baptist, you could appeal to the, I believe it was the, the state legislature and, and not have your taxes go to, go the, to the congregationalists. Yeah. Patrick Henry in Virginia had proposed a different scheme. He said, well, we know that church life is essential for the virtue without which republics fail. So let's let individuals designate which church their tax money should go for. James Madison argued successfully against that plan, and with the argument taken up by his Baptist friends, with the argument that any kind of establishment of religion is inevitably, inexorably corrupting. Mm. And that then became the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, late 1780s, which receives a lot of attention and cited often in Supreme Court cases, but was really an anomaly at the time. That very strong idea of separation of church and state really takes a full generation to percolate down into the into the various states. I want to return to that point because, I mean, it's just a maxim in uh, current day America, of separation of church and state, and it's understood to be sort of... Uh, uh, in maybe its most um, absolutist manner, um, when I speak to my kids about it, they just assume it means that, oh, from the very beginning, America wanted no presence of religion, for example, in public schools or uh, in things like uh, uh, sponsor sponsorship of church activities or um, even things like the controversial case of the football coach who led a public school football coach who led his, his players in prayer. So, um, which came up recently, but we'll, we'll, we'll re return to that. Um, I, I wanted to uh, sh uh, share with viewers a quotation here about the Bible in early America uh, and something that maybe you can um, explain for us further. So you write in regard to two different trends, which sort of integrate. It was as if Martin Luther and Thomas Jefferson had met, argued, converted each other, and then determined to work in harness. So can you explain what's up there? Well, I was trying to um, indicate how thoroughly Protestant public life is in the United States. And again, you just have to underscore that at, at the time of the American Constitution, maybe one or 2% of the American population had a Catholic attachment. It, gr it grows slightly uh, into the 1820s, but it's not really until the 1830s that we have a serious Catholic migration from from Germany and then eventually from Ireland and that, that begins to ch change the the uh, public dynamic but the early United States is really Protestant so Martin Luther but the early United States becomes libertarian in the sense that Jefferson wanted to, do, to be libertarian and so the idea that there should be a formal uh, establishment of churches to help guide public policy, but even more to provide the virtue for private citizens. That, that notion, it, it's, it's hammered during the uh, revolution, it's weakened during the Constitution era, and it kind of fades away by the time we get to the 1830s. Nonetheless, and, and this <laughs> becomes the, the complication for what separation of church and state means, because the early United States is so Protestant, and everybody, when they, when they say the word Bible, they have in their head the King James Bible. The King James Bible becomes an agent, an, an, an instrument that Protestants of all sorts think they can use in public life mm -hmm. in a way that does not violate the separation of, of church and state. And you may want to ask a question about this later, but as late as 1952, 1952, the Supreme Court ratifies a decision of the Supreme Court of New Jersey that allowed public reading of the King of the Bible. It didn't have to be the King James Bible at that stage, but public reading of the Bible in New Jersey 
public schools. Public schools, right. So, and there is a long and contested judicial battle that doesn't begin until the 1850s and, and, and extends to the, the, the Supreme Court decisions in the 1960s that, that banned the practice of devotional Bible reading. But because in the early United States, uh, loyalty to the King James Bible seemed non-sectarian. That, that was a key term. Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, yes. Unitarians, yes. Universalists. Yes. Yeah. Uh, with Catholics not really in the picture yet. No one's the, objecting. The very small Jewish population in the United States is, is profoundly attached to, to the scriptures and to the place of the scriptures in, in public life. So we're going, we're not going to have formal support of churches, but the, the simple acceptance of the presence, the usefulness, the need of the King James Bible. That's almost a completely different pattern. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it strikes me reading the book too, and just hearing you now, that, um, I mean, this is an extraordinary experiment. This is an American experiment, principally. I mean, what other model would there be? I mean, even in the Protestant countries of Northern Europe, uh, they have basically uh, state churches. Uh, in the UK, you have Presbyterianism in Scotland and Anglicanism in England. Uh, so, I mean, Americans are just figuring this out. Is, I mean, is that basically right? It's just a sort of wild experiment of uh, religion, Bible, and state. Figuring it out as they go along. The, the, the <laughs> Netherlands has a kind of, uh, of precedent because there is real religious freedom. In, in the but nonetheless, the, 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 there is a state Protestant church, and there there is, I believe, state uh, subvention for Catholics in, in the, uh, the Catholic part of the United, United uh, Provinces. Yes, America is an experiment. Can can there be a non-establishment regime that is still seriously religious and able to use, in this case, the Bible, the King James Bible, for a public purpose? And yes. that that, uh, that was the American experiment. And uh, into the 1830s, some Protestants thought it would really uh, set the United States apart as not just a free country, but a Christian country mm -hmm. in, 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 a, in very meaningful terms, mm -hmm. not with a formal church establishment, but nonetheless in very meaningful terms. Yes, yes. Yeah, that comes through clearly in the book as a country... Uh, which God will bless, uh, and it goes hand in hand with the notion of virtue, which you speak about. You quote, um, I think it's Washington's farewell address, can it be that providence has not connected the permanent felicity of a nation with its virtue? Uh, so that notion of individual virtue, that really struck me from reading. Um, yeah, really, really enlightening um, to get a sense of the worlds in which uh, early Americans uh, saw themselves in. Um, I, now, we mentioned that uh, there was general enthusiasm for the Bible. <laughs> Excuse me. I mean, it's a deeply religious society. Uh, and... oh, well, yeah, Gabe, let me just break in. There is general enthusiasm for the Bible, but it, it's not clear that the early United States was that much of a religious society. And part okay. of the book, part of the book tries to suggest that it, it's the, it's the re vigorous unprecedented energy of the Methodists to a little to, to, to somewhat lesser extent the Baptist, Baptist and then to a lesser extent the other Protestant groups that actually do Christianize a population that is kind of instinctively Protestant as a default option okay. but, but it's not necessarily yes. all that active so uh, the demographics of American religion are always kind of a black box but the real good estimates would, would suggest that maybe a fifth of Americans at the time of the Constitution, maybe less, are actively week to week involved in their churches. Interesting. By the Interesting. time we get to the 1850s, okay. by the time we get to the 1850s, it's close to half. Mm -hmm. Now, you say, so what, what's the alternative if you're not involved in churches? Well, there is no alternative. And that, that's why 20% a, a, a of the population active as Protestants, a very tiny percent active as Catholics, means that this, this is. Uh, apart from Republican political theory itself, the only value system was widespread okay. recognition. Okay, okay, that's an so, important yes. clarification. That's an important clarification, right? Uh, actually, uh, I I wanted to bring up that not everyone, uh, even 
in a low key way was enthusiastic about the Bible or religion because you spent some time speaking about the amazing impact of a short book, I think a short book written by Thomas Paine uh, in the 1790s. I didn't write down the exact that year. You probably know the, yeah. this is Age of Reason. What year was that? It's Seven, well, it's it's two parts, and, and by the time the second part is out, it actually is a pretty long book, 1794 okay. and 1795, uh, okay. The Age of Reason. Okay, okay, terrific, yeah. So, um, I mean, Thomas Paine will be known to some viewers as uh, the author of the uh, Revolutionary War pamphlet, Common Sense, uh, and the way you present his second work, or at least this work, uh, The Age of Reason, uh, is as a, a call for a, a religious revolution after the political revolution. And this, the story of Paine himself is um, interesting because he's traveling at this time. He's not just in the U.S. I think he might have been in the U.K. when Was he in the U.K.? when it was? He's in, he's, in Fr he's in France, and he's actually in prison when he does the first part of the Age of Reason. He, he's after the American Revolution that he helps promote and, and the, the pamphlet you mentioned, Common Sense, has, has a very significant section of exegesis of First Samuel, where Israel takes a king and, and uh, uh, Samuel says that, for that terrible yeah. thing to do. And, and the pamphlet, using that argument, is really effective in weaning Americans away from the idea of an of a inherited kingship. This, can I just explain a bit? Sorry, but to just the, the context of First Samuel, uh, and you'll know it better than I do, but I'll, I'll give a shot at it first, that... Um, uh, I mean, Israel observes the nations around it who have kings right, right. and uh, eventually demand a king. And God points the prophet Samuel to Saul initially, but then everything, everything goes wrong, more or less. So, yeah. Exactly. And, and that uh, that's what Payne uh, demonstrates. He says, look, you people, you're foolish to, to retain your loyalty to King George the third, because we have this biblical teaching that uh, denies the value of a king from on, on high. And and, and uh, there, there were actually loyalists who responded and probably with better biblical exegesis. Yeah, but yeah. There, there are parallels too, just uh, in the context of this uh, channel, there are parallels too with yeah. critiques of uh, so-called Islamic monarchies, uh, especially critique of Saudi Arabia. Uh, and the case is often made. I mean, even the Ayatollah Khomeini makes this case in his speeches that led up to the Islamic revolution. Um, be, because he's speaking against the Shah in his time in the 1970s, that Islam is no place for hereditary monarchy. Uh, this is not the system willed by God and, and manifested by the, the early Islamic rulers. Uh, they were not kings, they were caliphs. So interesting to see that Thomas Paine brought up, I mean, uh, in a different time and different... Well, I'm, I'm, I'm actually Parallel guessing that there, that there were uh, there are counter uh, Muslim voices like the loyalists who, who pointed to Passages in the New Testament, First Peter, love God and honor the emperor. <laughs> so mm. there, there's, there's a debate, although, yes, that, that debate is important. Anyhow, Payne, after he uh, helps promote the, the American Revolution, returns to Britain, but then is, uh, uh, in effect, I, exiled because of his promotion of radical political ideas. He goes to France at the start of the French Revolution because he sees it as, as the, the next stage in the progress of liberty. But as so many of those who were in France in the early stage of the revolution, he's actually <laughs> caught up in, in the counter-revolution and is actually in prison thinking that he may, in fact, be executed in, in 17, I think it's 1793, but certainly 1794. And during that time, he writes The Age of Reason with the argument that we have begun to see the virtue of political liberty in our day. Now it's time to free us from the tyranny of the old ideas that are connected with uh, uh, corrupt and tyrannizing loyalty to, to the Bible. I so mean, I, part, Mark, sorry to jump in, but I, I just wanted to mention off the bat that I, I was just amazed at the severity of his rhetoric against the Bible. I mean, this isn't like a cautious, uh, <laughs> gentle critique or suggestion. Alter I mean, it is like a intense, uh, 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 enthusiastic refutation of the teaching of the Bible, of the logic and reason of the Bible. I mean, it's shocking. I mean, he. What's the subtitle of the book? Something about the true and fabulous. 
do, do you have it? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, and Payne is a terrific writer too. So uh, when, when he gets the exercise, he is really exercised. The book is in two parts because um, when the first part is published, there is a, a, a tremendous reaction in England and it, it's a reaction defending the Bible, but also critiquing Payne as just a disorganizer of society. He's released from prison. I'm not sure I, where he ends up exactly. I think maybe back back in England. And he reads some of this protest and immediately he spins off this part two, which is longer. And, and uh, it's a detailed book by book denunciation of what he calls the superstition, uh, the immorality, the grossness of, 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 the, of the scriptures. He, he takes on a miracle, for example, as just a, a remnant of the past. There's, there's a very offensive section in part two of, of, about the Christian teaching concerning the virginity of, of Mary. He does, he does many, many times say, I admire Jesus, great teacher of, of, of uh, morality. But it really is a, a sharp denunciation of, of what Paine thinks is the next step in the liberation of humankind after mm -hmm. getting rid of monarchy. Now we I have to get rid of the uh, corrupting ideas. Of the, yes, I, I want to read just a short passage to give viewers a sense of uh, his rhetoric about the Bible. This is about the, the Old Testament. He writes, uh, and I'm, I, I didn't do the archival research. I'm just quoting from what you've quoted, uh, Mark, here. So he writes, uh, Thomas Paine, whenever we read the obscene stories, the voluptuous debaucheries, the cruel and tortuous executions, the unrelenting vindictiveness with which more than half the Bible is filled, it would be more consistent that we called it the word of a demon than the word of God. So you can see Payne's a, a very effective writer. Yes. And it, the book the, sold. I mean, it wasn't that yeah. uh, it's just some guy off in a corner writing for himself. I mean, pe people were reading this, right? I mean, including Americans. Well, now this And this is a, the crux of the book and why it starts at 1794. Uh, Payne's Age of Reason is reprinted as often, 1794 to 1796, as common sense was reprinted in 1776. And that, that historians in general see that common sense publication is crucial for moving American public opinion against Britain. The, the, there, there are uh, uh, something like 15 or 16, maybe as many 20 American publishers who publish The Age of Reason. And then there are, are a, a text imported from, the, from Britain. Now, for the purpose of my book, however, what's, what's more important even than Paine's provocation is the American response. From 1794 into the early 19th century, there are, are at least 80 or 90 American published refutations of, of Paine. That's incredible. They, and of those, eight, well, I should say there are 80 or 90 responses to pain. Of those, and I, I kept finding more and more. So I, there may have been even, even some I, I, I was never aware of. Two or three defend pain, but the rest are just uniformly against him. And they're uniformly from, uh, the Americans are reprinting some of the uh, literature that comes from England. Some of that literature is from high church Anglicans. Some of it is from Unitarians. In America, there, there is uh, literature, literature, books, big books in some cases, uh, unreadable, absolutely. You just fall asleep reading <laughs> these things. From lay people, from ministers, from Baptists, Presbyterians, Congregationalists. There's one Jewish author, it's actually a, an English Jewish respected scholar, whose work is reprinted in America, attacking pain. There is uh, a really interesting uh, uh, response by a Sandemanian, a, a really a narrow tech, extremely uh, dissenting, extremely opposed to anything establishment. But this, from this course of voices, there is a defense of the Bible that I think becomes important for moving the United States from conventional, uh, taken for granted Protestant loyalty to scripture to a kind of loyalty to scripture that's looking to the Bible for direction in how to live in this 
new Republican experiment. So, I mean, so the book is an existential threat. It's not just a argument against oh. the coherence of the Bible, but it's a threat to uh, the foundations of virtue and scripture upon which this American project is is uh, advancing. And then uh, unlike the, the Payne's Common Sense in 1776 has a big effect. It's published in Boston, Philadelphia, New York, and one or two other places. The 80 or 90, 60 or 70, whatever they are, responses to, to Payne's Adrian come from everywhere. Mm -hmm. Recent, recently, a, a really nice article published. I'm just momentarily forgetting the author, but on, on the first work published in the territory of Mississippi, mm -hmm. early 19th century, is a refutation of of pain, a to reason. Uh, there, there are uh, small presses in out of the way places that that publish or republish works against pain, and the the, the Reaction against pain in 1794 and following is stronger, I would try to make the case, than the uh, uh, agreement in 1776 that pain has made cogent arguments against the monarchy. Okay. And that's that's why the, the 1794 is in, in the title of the book, because it, it does seem to me to open a new chapter, not just in simple loyalty to the Bible, but how the loyalty of the Bible is worked out as crucial at a time in American history when things are up for grabs. So late 1790s, the, the Jeffersonians and the Hamiltonians are beginning to maneuver against each other. The election of 1800, uh, Jefferson and Adams for, for uh, re-election is nas nastier than anything we've seen in recent political discourse. Yeah, that seems hard have, to imagine, but I trust didn't you. Have, you, you, you. You didn't have Twitter and you know, social media. Yeah. So, yeah. But the published the published uh, polemics in, in 1800 are fiercer than the, than the are as fierce than, than the polemic, polemics we see today. Uh, the, the economy is, is in trouble. There, there is uh, concern about native uprisings in, in the uh, West. So it's a time of great uh, turmoil in, in the, the United yeah. States. The, the hero, Washington, is retiring. How can, how can public life and, and part of the answer is the scriptures will give us a way ahead. The scriptures will give us mm. ba ballast in the turbulent mm. seas of the 19th century. Yeah. Is is the article, is the author by Seth Perry? Is that the yes, article? Yes, thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I just yeah, looked great, it up quickly. Great. I found it there about the, about uh, Thomas Paine. Uh, I think oh, the article is entitled yeah. Paine Detected in Mississippi, but P-A-I-N-E, right, right, the author. Yeah. Very, um, very, very, I, I was trying to think what could be a parallel to an attack against the Bible and, and a robust response. I mean, I was sort of thinking, is it like the Da Vinci Code? Some of the viewers remember the Da Vinci Code as now a couple of decades ago. Uh, and there were different sort of pious responses to why, you know, uh, Jesus didn't marry, excuse me, didn't, didn't marry Mary Magdalene. Uh, there are Islamic, a whole series of Islamic mm -hmm. polemics against the Bible. Probably the most famous 20th century polemicist was a South African named Ahmed Didat. People responded to him. So um, those are some parallels that came into my mind. Um, Just, but they, I mean, the response to the Da Vinci Code was not like that. I mean, I think Da Vinci Code uh, sort of won won the day from in the public imagination, at least. So, probably more copies of the Da Vinci Code sold than all of the polemics again. For yeah. for the, the for the people that have written against the Quran, is the writing or the the context also at a time of broader? Uh, governmental redirection. I mean, this this what struck me actually quite a while ago. The, the prompt for uh, getting into some of this research that the that the dispute you could you could call it a religious Bible focused dispute over pain took place at this time of nation formation, when the American experiment is is uh, up for grabs and people people are not sure at all what direction do we take? So at that particular moment. Yeah, yeah I can see why figures. it was so sensitive. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, with the case of the Islamic polemics against the Bible, there isn't a, a longer tradition or a medieval work. So this is sort of in some ways woven into the fabric of uh, early Islamic uh, self-identification vis-a-vis competing religious trends. However, uh, and this is another topic, maybe we could have a second episode and talk about these things. But what you do have in the 19th and early 20th century is an enthusiastic, robust, mostly 
Protestant, at least in the beginning, missionary movement to places in the Islamic world. Uh, and the mass publication of tracts uh, advocating the Bible, uh, sometimes explicitly attacking the Quran. So there is there is this there is a notion of a threat to Islam that provokes some of the response. Um, yeah. So, but if we can if we can move forward, sort of uh, dramatically, <laughs> uh, because we've spent a lot of time in the early post revolutionary period. Um, we, for those of you who are interested in learning more about uh, Marx's work and opinions about the role of the Bible in the debate over slavery, which doesn't just appear around the Civil War, I mean, it begins as already well, maybe maybe in the 17th century, definitely in the 18th century, right? The use of the Bible for this debate. Um, uh, gosh, I was just hearing, I heard a podcast about a Quaker who was in Barbados and then in Philadelphia, who was an abolitionist in the 17th, I think in the 17th century. I may be mistaken. Well, there's, a, there's a series of Quaker, Benjamin Lay, I think. But That's Benjamin. who I'm thinking of, Benjamin Lay, yes. He, he, yeah. he, he publishes, actually Benjamin Franklin publishes his track against slavery early 1730s it just is has no traction whatsoever interesting interesting, interesting. a little bit later when quaker voices anthony benizet and john woolman published some more i mean actually really thoughtful biblical attacks as well as quaker attacks but yeah. they too really are not 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 responded to until we get to the 1770s mm. So maybe I can just uh, invite everyone to find the podcast uh, Minding Scripture. And there's a, an episode there with Professor Noel where we speak specifically on the question of slavery and the Bible. Um, I mean, maybe it'll come up sort of retrospectively because I'd like to actually jump all the way to the post-bellum, so the, uh, the post-Civil War period, um, and uh, take, take us up to, just in light of time, take us up to uh, 1911 and then to the, the current moment. Uh, so it was interesting how you sort of corrected me there and sketched a uh, an increasing religiousness in the American population that wasn't maybe as robust in the early post-revolutionary period, but become so in the mid 19th century. Uh, but then you speak of in the post-bellum, post-Civil War period, um, this, sort of the end or, of the Bible civilization in America. Um, so, yeah, I mean, would you? Uh, how would you explain that, and what replaces it? Right. Well, the tra trajectory and, and the argument of, of the book is that uh, in the early days of the United States, there is a a, a pan-Protestant effort to to do something to stabilize the republic, and the something is turned to the Bible. But then the effort to create a Bible civilization does falter, partly because the Protestant um, landscape begin, begins to give way. And you, you do get what we would call a religious pluralism. They're very, they're yeah, I was going to say, I mean, it, it must be connected to the immigration you already alluded yeah. to that starts, I mean, yeah. especially yeah. Catholics, but also Jews in the mid-19th right. century. You have massive waves of immigration. However, however, before... Pluralization of religion has its effect on American public consciousness. There is an intra-Protestant division over quite a few things, but particularly slavery. That, in my view, is, is an even stronger reason for why the effort to create a, a Bible civilization falters. But and, and then the Civil War itself becomes a, a an intensely Bible moment with uh, white partisans in the South and then the North viewing their side as biblically justified in what they're doing. And uh, it, it's it's the army, it's the Northern army that wins out. So what, what happens if you have this uh, idea of a civilization built on the Bible, and, and that idea really is fractured. Uh, and, and there are, there, I mean, to this day, there are people who want to organize things by the Bible, but it doesn't work because um, not only are there divisions among Bible believers, Protestants, Catholics, Mormons, about what the Bible teaches and how it should be applied. But then there are uh, Catholics, there's Jews, there's non-believers, and there's all, there's all sorts of world religion. So you just can't have that kind of situation. But we still have an interesting history of the Bible because it remains a culturally significant point of reference. Um, the first widely recognized black painter 
in the United States as, as, a, as a young man, a son of a AME, uh, African Methodist Episcopal Bishop by the name of Turner, Osawa Turner. His paintings are some of the most evocative biblical scenes painted in the, in the 19th century by any American, maybe by anyone, I'm not, I'm not an art, art, art uh, critic. I have a, a chapter in, in the book on, on uh, what happens in public speech after the assassination of President Garfield in 1881, the president of McKinley in 1901. Uh, the newspapers, and this by this time we have widespread newspapers, and thank goodness we have tools now in our day to get at what's in the newspapers. Newspapers and individual publications are filled with sermons, almost all of which keyed off a of Bible text Wow. to talk about wow. how wonderful Garfield was, how wonderful McKinley was. They're really quite so different. They're, re they're reprinting sermons that were preached. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Daily uh, major newspapers like the Chicago yeah. Tribune would wow. into the well into the 20th century on Monday have a have a sermon from the previous Sunday that you, you could read. And on these occasions, uh, my wife, Maggie, who, who was actually employed by the University of Notre Dame to be my assistant, scoured, easily found a couple of hundred of sermons that were printed, newspapers or separately printed after, after the deaths of these uh, presidents. And they're all, virtually all, Bible referenced, but in quite different ways than the, from, say, the, the, the funeral sermons for George Washington in, in, in 1870. He died right at the end of 1799, 1800. So you have, it, it's not any more a coherent story. Uh, I think until you, until you get to religious pluralization, until you get to Protestant disagreement on slavery, you do have something of a coherent story with mm -hmm. people, organizations like the American Bible Society, the American Tract Society, providing a kind of center to the broad American history movement, not, not after the Civil War. But your, your question, what, what do we have then? And, and I think yes, the, yes. the simple answer is just confusion <laughs> and uh interesting you, you even have objections i mean in the book you speak about jewish objections to the reading of the king james bible in schools right. uh even catholics uh catholics. I mean, this is a protestant bible um uh, gosh uh, i i forget who it was but you have a quotation from some catholic who says um oh he says I don't know something something about why where will you find in America lessons on the Immaculate Conception or something and maybe it's not the Immaculate Conception but there's no place where Catholic things are being done and yet this right. Protestant Bible is being uh, taught to our children yeah so the first the first challenge is to the the widespread use of the King James Bible in the public schools comes from Catholic parents uh, okay. And uh, actually, John McGreevy, the Notre Dame historian, now provost. Yeah, now provost, yeah. Yeah, it's ter terrific uh, material on uh, cases. Uh, one of them, Boston in 1854, and one in Ellsworth, Maine, 1850-something, uh, where Catholic parents bring bring suits to stop the King James reading, and, and they lose. Uh, uh, Steve Green, a, a, a really uh, hardworking legal historian, has a couple of excellent books on the state cases, the cases in state courts challenging uh, Bible, King James reading, first from Catholics, then from Jews, then eventually from uh, people who we would call secular non-believers. But again, some of those cases eventually begin to win, some of them lose, and, and Again, it's 1952, the United States Supreme Court unanimously agrees that New Jersey can keep its Bible readings. There, there are people can opt out of things. It's not until 1962 or three that the Supreme Court says no devotional reading of the Bible in schools is uh, the establishment of, of religion. So yeah, yeah. You, have, you have the loss of the Protestant rationale early on, but the continuation of uh, yeah. this reading which originally, even by, <laughs> this is part of a re really great story, but uh, Horace Mann, who's looked upon as the kind of founder of systematic public education in, in the United States, secretary of the Massachusetts School Board, throughout his career has extended defenses of using non-sectarian Bible reading as a way of helping young people 
become the moral citizens that our nation requires. We don't want to have preaching. We don't want to have evangelization. We want to have the Bible. So this is the founder, widely regarded, of the theory of American public education. And I would say what had been a kind of messianic Christian view of the Bible became a kind of messianic public view of the Bible. So, so does this mean that when people say today, oh, in America, we have separation of church and state, and there are you know, evangelical Christians out there who are trying to break that down today, uh, but we've always had separation of church and state, and you know, you know, like the guy who wants to pray with his football players or something, this yeah. is like, this is in violation of an ancient American principle. I mean, not to defend one side or the other, but I mean, it's actually not that clear. It's, that... A, it's, it's a very complicated story. Yeah. And, and um, yeah. for the poor jurists that have to rule on this, if 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 yeah. they dip their toes into the, histor into the historical river, they're going to find that it's a big, big river and it's running really fast. Interesting, interesting. I want to mention another just brief uh, example of the increasing religious pluralism. Um, so uh, are we okay if we went another five, 10 minutes, Mark? Would that be okay? Sure, sure. Bye, bye, okay, bye. super. Sure. Yeah. So uh, because you mentioned the, the, the remarkable change in demographics, and uh, we're experiencing that today, of course, as well, which is, makes it so interesting. I mean, Catholics who had been a tiny percentage of the American population in the post-revolutionary period are 30% by 1920. Jews had become 6%. By 1920, so I mean, just a radical change in the demographics, also just explosion of population. You give some really fascinating statistics about how Chicago got over a million, around this period went over a million people and all of this. So, um, but then you have the case of the Latter-day Saints or the Mormons, um, who, uh, well, I, I won't try to venture the dates, but are appearing and uh, in the 19th century with an extraordinary uh, story um with violence and persecution but i mean for our purposes they also are extraordinary in another way which is they have a new book actually i think more than one book um so what what is the response to this does uh is there just widespread rejection of this new movement is there the sense that they're a problem not only because of their ethical practices or something like that but specifically because they don't have a firm foundation in the bible alone well, the Mormon story, as you can imagine, is a is a great one, but also a complicated one. There's a really good book by a historian called Philip Barlow and Mormons in the Bible from actually maybe 20 or more years ago now. And then there's been a there's I, I think I try to mention in the book at least some of the really fine scholarship. The, the story is complicated because Joseph Smith, after what he see what he calls it, the, the visit from the angel and the, the presence of the Book of Mormon that he, he uh, translates publishes the Book of Mormon in 18, it's 1830 or 1831, and then there's immediate pushback, but also immediate attraction. In part because Joseph Smith, well, it's very hard to talk about these in neutral terms. From, from Joseph Smith's angle, the angel appears to him to show him where the Book of Mormon is hidden because there is so much intra-Protestant difference on interpreting the Bible. Okay. Joseph okay. says, Mother Lucy Smith is a serious, I think she's actually involved in several different Protestant groups, and she comes away uh, disturbed because there are so many different interpretations of the Bible. Yes. yes. Parenthetically, this will be at the time of the American Civil War, one of the main uh, charges in the Catholic press. This war is caused, it's the, it's the final end product of Protestants arguing over who interprets the Bible correctly. Mm -hmm. And this idea that every person should interpret the Bible for themselves, which is broadcast everywhere in America, has led to this disastrous civil war. Well, Lucy Smith and then Joseph Smith, her son, felt that earlier and, and the Book of Mormon is the response. But of course, there's tremendous pushback. Uh, Joseph Smith's a fraud, he, he's, he's uh, uh, demented. Of course, the Book of Mormon is, 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 is quite disregarded as, as a literary artifact. It's really quite, quite uh, interesting. Anyhow, uh, 1844, Joseph Smith is murdered in, in Illinois as, as the saints are contemplating a, a move uh, further west. They, they do get to Utah. They, it, it, they're they're, they're uh, 
opposed by the U.S. government. There's a series of, of uh, court cases before they're allowed to come into the to the uh, United States, and, and the Bible is always present there. Now, there's all sorts of ironies and details. Uh, in, in the 1870s, uh, there, there's a challenge to, to defend Mormon plural marriage on the Bible. And a, a big name American uh, Protestant comes out from the East and there's a big debate with a, a Mormon scholar who's defending plural marriage, but very different than the earlier debates over slavery, they don't register. And when the United States Congress and the courts act to uh, restrain, make, make plural marriage illegal, there's almost no Bible reasoning. It's because the traditions of America, the legal principles of America. Interesting. Are Interesting. So, so you yeah. have, you have a, a group. Yeah, of I find that very out. surprising. I find that shocking. That well, you're right. So yeah. yes, uh, but then Mormons, are, Utah is admitted to the United States. Mormons gradually move to the mainstream. Mm -hmm. uh, in recent years, uh, the the the, the the website of the of the the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints emphasizes Jesus Christ. Church of Jesus Christ, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, and for for the purposes of the history of the Bible, it is significant that uh, the Mormons remain one of the groups, along with African American churches, most firmly loyal to the King James version of the Bible. Interesting. Joseph Smith himself produced an edition of the King James Bible with his commentary, with some some adaptation, some adjustment. It's not, however, an official. Mormon document. It's a well well respected Mormon document, and the the hierarchy of the Mormon Church is recently, as I'm not going to get the dates right, within the last maybe twenty years, has said, well, new Bible translations, are, of course, are appropriate in their place, but for our purposes, for for worship and and teaching, we, we want to stick to the King James Bible. Yeah. So you have a group that was opposed by defenders of the King James Bible for a very, very long period of time. Now, one of the groups in the United States that is is uh, most loyal to the yeah, King James fascinating. Bible. Fascinating, yeah. And that's a perfect segue, I think not intentional, but I did want to ask why, uh, or about the significance of ending your coverage, your chronological coverage in 1911. Uh, this is the 300th anniversary of right. the uh, of the publication of the King James Bible. Um, so, um, I mean, is, 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 are there other special things that uh, change or is there something um, uh, about the way that that date is recognized in American society that makes it a good ending point for your coverage? Well, part of the reason for ending in 1911 is just exhaustion. This is <laughs> already, but the, the serious point was that um, uh, in the same way that there is there is a lot more Bible in public life than we, we can think of, like 1901 when McKinley is, is assassinated, sermons in the daily newspaper on Bible text. There's a tremendous generation of publicity in 1911 for the 300th anniversary of the King James Bible. 2011, we had, we had some publicity. I remember reading two or three articles in, in the New York Times, for example, Queen Elizabeth, had said some nice things. Um, some people in America did, did too. But in, in 1911, there, there is just a blanket coverage. Um, uh, early on in the, the process, I, I, I found out that that um, uh, Woodrow Wilson, Theodore Roosevelt, and William Jennings Bryan all gave speeches on mm. the King James Bible within wow. weeks of each other around the anniversary. Anniversary in, in spring and early summer. Of, of, the last of, person, the last name you mentioned was a presidential contender, but never president. Right. Yeah. Three, okay. William Jennings Bryan, three times Democratic nominee for president. W Wilson was at the time the governor of Virginia, uh, uh, New Jersey. Roosevelt was the ex president, but kind of maneuvering back in, in the public life. And they all say wonderful things about the King James Bible. Now, the point for, the, for my book, why these speeches, and then I would say, 90% of the dozens, hundreds of, of public statements, publications featured the, the, the moral, democratic, public use of the Bible rather than anything specifically Christian. Okay, okay. okay. There, were, there were two or three Protestants and, and one very shrewd Catholic 
writer who said, and in this case, actually, the Catholic writer whose name is escaping right now, but he joined with other prominent Catholics, uh, Bishop Kenrick, who, who provided a Catholic translation of the Bible, Bishop James Gibbons, who wrote a phenomenally popular Faith of Our Fathers, Faith of Our Father, uh, using the scriptures in a Protestant way to argue. Make the, the Catholic case. <laughs> it's a really, really sharp. Clever. Anyhow, this particular Catholic commentator in 1911, his, his name escapes me now, was like these some of these earlier Catholics and saying the King James Bible is, is a tremendous literary resource, and, and it's a tremendous religious resource. It's not the Catholic's Bible. Catholics have some objections, but we, we recognize it, its greatness. Mm. However, in this year of, of uh, celebration, why is it that so many Protestant celebrators of the King James Bible are talking about, as Woodrow Wilson did, its support for democracy. How come so many are talking about, as many, many uh, sort of academics did, its contribution to the language? Why are not people talking about the Bible's importance for individuals and groups being reconciled to God? In other words, he was making the critique that in some sense I, I'm making as a historical observation, that by the early 20th century, the public use of the Bible in the United States, which is different than the private and synagogue and congregational use, the public use of the Bible in the United States had become uh, a, a, a part of the uh, social and political landscape and not really very religious in, in narrow terms. So 1911 and, and the huge amount of publication underscored or, 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 or demonstrated the conclusion that uh, the Bible civilization had taken over, the remnants of the Bible civilization had taken over the public meaning of the Bible from anything explicitly Christian or, or, or Jewish, uh, for that matter. Fascinating. We well, have one last question, which is about the current day. And uh, it, it seems to me that... Um, well, there's an immense amount that could be said between 19, 1911 and today. But uh, even today, it seems to me that um, in the Western world, America is still exceptional in the relatively uh, uh, a central place of the Bible in American public discourse and American religious devotion. I mean, even with the rise of the unaffiliated, I mean, the meteoric rise of unaffiliated, still relatively, um, there's more a religious practice in the United States and most Western countries, and probably the group that has withstood the rise of the unaffiliated the best are evangelical uh, Protestants, um, for whom the Bible is really at the center of it all. Um, so um, I don't know, maybe it's not fair to ask you to prognosticate, but I wanted to ask, uh, I mean, if you agree with that assessment, um, do you think this is long lasting? Is it sort of uh, a fundamental part of the American Constitution and things will continue this way? Or do you think we're just actually at the beginning of a transformational process? We're following Europe. There was lots of piety in Europe before and we're heading down that road and pretty soon we'll be a post-Christian, post-biblical society. Historians have trouble trying to <laughs> Think about the future. The past, the past means, and so even more trouble about the future. Uh, I think that the secularizing trends will certainly continue. I think um, the uh, pluralization of American society, and it's not just religious pluralization, but the, the pluralization in all ways will, will, will make it more and more difficult to have any, any one single source of authority have real traction in, in the uh, society. I do, however, believe that because of the shape of the American past, which has um, relied upon voluntary organization, has offered, offered scope for uh, uh, people to publicize their ideas. And, and what I uh, cover in the book, there are just any, any number of stories of, of out of the way people using secondhand type and printers making a real significant contribution in publishing the Bible. Uh, one of the great stories I stumbled upon was the translation published in 1876 by Julius Smith, a self-trained 
New England person who learned Greek and Hebrew and did her, her own translation of the Bible and published it. Now, no scholars paid any attention, and, and she, she was lionized by some of the feminists of the era. She, she herself was not a feminist. Um, what I'm trying to say is that because of the looseness of American society in general, I think there will continue to be a space for people, for example, doing new translations of the Bible. Uh, from, from beginning with the Revised Standard Version of 1950, then going on to the Kenneth Taylor Living Bible in the early 1960s, the New International Version, the English Revised Version, uh, new translations that the Catholic Church has provided. The United States is the world leader in new translations of the Bible. You know, a scholar of scripture like yourself would say, well, is the result confusion <laughs> or, or, or is it uh, a greater accessibility? I think the U.S. The United States will continue to be a place where there's a lot of dynamic Bible translation, selling of the Bibles, reading of the Bibles, a lot of different efforts to, to bring biblical wisdom into the public square, but also tremendous confusion and tremendous diversity in how that continues. Whether or not the, uh, the profusion of Bible-related events will retard the process of secularization. I, I don't. I think that's that's an open question. But mm. I, I think there will Fair still enough. be there still will be a, a really interesting Bible-related story that now would would include, of course, all sorts of Protestants, Catholics, Jews, and and for all of those groups, as well as Mormons and others, uh, for all of those groups, uh, a new era of contribution from outside the United States, with the, particularly since the mid-1960s and, and the change of immigration laws. We, we, I think there's a new day of religious life in the United States. It's not Anglo-Saxon, it's not German, it's not Irish, but it is what? Hispanic, Chinese, yes, yes. Uh, African. Yes, yes. And that, and, that too will play a, play a role. Yes. In the, the, and the, I, I would add that uh, add to that as well that there is there will be a story to be written in addition about the Muslim engagement with the Bible, yes. um, yeah. not considered scripture for most most Muslims, um, but nevertheless there's a rise in interest as the Muslim population in the West grows in in the Bible or in places in the Muslim majority world where they're Christian minorities, um, and I think I mean it's part of part of the idea of this YouTube channel is. Uh, to bring together interesting conversations like this one on um, both the Quran and the Bible. Um, the Quran in many ways is part of the story of the Bible. It receives the Bible, develops develops its own theological arguments about biblical stories and characters. So that that's an interesting uh, element too. Yeah, definitely. And, and I, let me just add as a, a promo that, that you're taking this on and, and particularly with that kind of comparison, Quran and, and the Bible reading. Just seems to me not not only historically and um, in terms of religious studies theology justified, but actually is a real strong contribution to public awareness in our day. Thank you, thank you very much, friends. Uh, the most recent book from Professor Mark Knoll is again America's book, The Rise and Decline of a Bible Civilization, 1794 to 1911, published by Oxford University Press in 2022. I'm sure available in all the usual places. So uh, it's an extraordinary book. Um, please consider purchasing it. Um, are there other things you'd like to mention before we close or ways in which interested uh, viewers might stay in touch with your work? Uh, my email is address available, if I think from the Notre Dame History website. And I'd, I'd be happy to chat with anyone about these these kind of matters. They, they are important, they're, they're complicated. And uh, sometimes good questions cannot be answered simply, but uh, th these are viable questions. And I, I, I actually feel privileged to have been spent, I don't know, 40 years or more, more than 40 years working on these issues. Great. Thank you so much, Mark. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, friends, thanks for being with us for this episode of Exploring the Quran and the Bible. I hope you found it to be an edifying discussion. I really hope that you find generally the um, the content on this channel to be useful. There's a really diverse range of things um, reg in regard to Quranic studies and biblical studies with top-notch scholars. And um, we'll be really grateful for your support. So please don't hesitate to like the videos, 
starting with this one maybe, to subscribe to the channel and to share the news with your friends about exploring the Quran and the Bible.